It is now my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. David Fennell is a professor in the Department of Tourism and Envir Environment at Brock University, which is located just across the border from us in, in Canada. He's recognized nationally and internationally for his work on tourism ethics. His research is primarily on the moral issues tied to the use of animals in the tour tourism industry. And he's published widely on this, on this topic. He's, Fennell, Dr. Fennell has written several books, including Ecotourism, Ecotourism Program Planning, Tourism Ethics, Code of Ethics in Tourism, and uh, more recently, a book entitled Tourism and Animal Ethics. How, how pertinent could that be as a speaker at today's symposium? A major thrust of, of Dr. Fennell's research involves the use of theory from other disciplines like biology and philosophy to gain traction on many of tourism's most persistent issues and problems. It's our pleasure to have Dr. Fennell with us today. I appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to, to be here. I was really pleased when, when Michael contacted me, well, I guess it was maybe a month ago, a month and a half ago, about uh, the symposium here. And it, uh, it really is right up my alley in terms of uh, my area of research. I also want to congratulate Michael on the, uh, on the message uh, and sharing that film with us. It was, it was outstanding. So thanks again for that. Um, I, I came to ecotourism, I was lucky, um, I started my masters in the mid-1980s mid and was one of the first, I think, in the world to, to do graduate work in that area, so again, came to it uh, at a very, very early stage in terms of uh, the development of ecotourism. And when I went to conferences, I would, uh, people would come up to me and say, you know, Dave, ecotourism is really the most ethical form of tourism out there, isn't it? And I would say, well, it is, or it should be. And that was just an intuition, it was, it was a gut reaction because we really didn't have that much empirical data out there or information on really how ethics applies to ecotourism. So I jumped, I jumped ship a little bit and went into the area of, uh, of ethics and spent a, a good deal of my time looking at some of the ethical issues in tourism. And then I came full circle with this and started looking at animal ethics and I thought that was, that was for me the tie that was binding all of this stuff together in in my research. So what I want to talk to you about today is really um, that sort of that third strand of the things that I've been doing uh, in the field here. So my purpose is to, is to push our thinking on, on tourism's moral community. And when we talk about moral community, we're talking about the, the animals, okay? I want to focus on the UNWTO Code of Ethics, um, how we might advance the Code of Ethics, uh, and it's a, a document that's been with us for about 20 years. I want to focus on ecotourism. And I also want to spend a bit of time on this first principle for ecotourism. It's a paper that I wrote uh, a couple years ago, and uh, it's been getting some traction in the field. And then a bit of a conclusion. So this is what we're up against uh, academically. Um, I submitted this paper, uh, well, it's just recently been published. but. It came up against a little bit of opposition, as you can see up here on the screen. I got some feedback uh, on, on the first couple of drafts of this work. And the first one was the paper does not provide any fresh or interesting insights for the reader. And the, and the paper is exploring the boundaries of this new moral code of ethics. Secondly, the paper assumes a pro-animal rights position. I know Michael's been talking about animal rights, and that's really, really important in our field. But the paper really is a paper on animal welfare, first and foremost. And I'll get to animal rights a little bit later in the presentation. And the one that struck me the hardest, I think, is this, this last one. We said that we can summarize all we need to know about tourism, animals' ethics, in essentially one paragraph. So this is our colleagues out there in the field. And in tourism, we really haven't been dealing with these, these issues to a great extent, as you can see here. So just a bit of information on the UNWTO Code of Ethics. I say, say it's been with us since 1999. And the, you know, one of the big strands in this document is, it, is that it's said to act as a reference for the responsible and sustainable development of world tourism. Some of the priority areas are the poor, some of the other marginalized folks that are out there who are involved in tourism in one way, shape, or form. And the third one here is accessibility. So providing accessibility for people to travel as tourists around the world. 
So let me just give you a, a little bit of information on some of the, the guidelines that you'll find in the code. Um, the code has 10 articles, okay, which are almost entirely anthropocentric. So for example, section one in article seven entitles tourists to direct and personal access to the discovery and enjoyment of the planet's resources. So this is what you'll find in the document. Uh, Article 2, Section 3, the exploitation of people, children, women, and men, or men, is said to conflict with the fundamental aims of tourism. Okay, so that's a pretty, pretty big statement within the document. And so as you read through it, you understand that there's far less emphasis which has been placed on the environment. So when we say anthropocentric, we really mean that it is people-centered. So Article 3, Section 1, the environment should be safeguarded for present and future sustainable human use. Okay, so that message is clear. Rare and precious resources like water and energy are to be saved, and that's in Article 3 and Section 2. And acts felt to be injurious, injurious to local people and local environments are not to be committed. So I'm missing, you know, as I, as I spun through this document, I spent a lot of time reading the document missing almost entirely is this discussion more broadly and specifically on the environment. So reference to animals, apart from the need to preserve endangered species, you can't find that at all or won't find that at all within the document. So as I, as I, as I focus on this, as I spend time reading it and looking at my, my area of, of emphasis and research, the issue to me is that there are millions of animals that are used annually to enhance our comfort, to enhance our pleasure and entertainment in the tourism industry. And we know that there's animals that compete against each other in racing and fighting contests, for example, as sources of food, okay, live animal markets in San Francisco or many other places around the world. Animals as workers, okay, in many different capacities. The example I have up here is, is carriers. And of course we have hunting and we've got angling and we certainly have wildlife viewing and this is where we focus on ecotourism. But there's a few questions that I think we need to start to focus on in looking forward in going beyond this document that was put together in 1999. So should the code say anything about animals that are not endangered? What about the welfare requirements of animals that support tourism? What about animal captives? is a big question for us here today. I know Michael spent some time talking about zoos and thinking about zoos as well. Are there cultural reasons for using animals in the tourism industry? Are there, well, we know there are economic reasons for using animals in, in the industry. And the last one here is have species specific standards of care been developed for such use? And these really aren't questions that we've asked in the past or dealt with in the past. And I think now's the time to start thinking about them as we move forward and as we reflect on the importance of this document for world tourism, and I'm talking about the code of ethics here. So it's not that we haven't tried. We, we, we talk about the environment liberally in tourism. We talk about social cultural impacts, we talk about economic impacts, and we certainly talk about these environmental impacts. So we try to institute this environmental thinking. So Myra Shackley, for example, says that horses, elephants, or camels may be used instead of cars and buses. Cars, well, okay, we know they're, they're dirty and they're loud. But there's no thinking on whether the use of animals might constitute an environmental sensitivity here. And, and so this, this, this is, again, a, a point of departure for us as we move in a completely different direction here. And so despite the fact that there is a robust literature on animal natures, sentience, intelligence, and once again, there was certainly not a lot of research in this area. We're just starting to embark again on this different, different uh, pathway. Okay, so these are questions that we really haven't addressed, but we really need to address in our research and certainly in the field too. And I think the two have to work together. So the question is, are we failing as a field if our frame of reference for responsible and sustainable tourism makes no room for animals? Does the code really represent new thinking? And does it reflect changing values at the dawn of the new millennium here? Shouldn't we be asking different questions? I guess is the point. So advancing the code is the second part of the presentation here. Um, 
so we need to emphasize different priorities. Uh, it's a vacant niche, I think, that needs filling, one that leaves us vulnerable. And I think this is really important. If we don't start talking about some of these issues, if we don't start asking some of these questions, it really does leave us vulnerable. It leaves us in the dust of other fields, of other disciplines that have started to talk about these issues. And I know we love animals, right? And when we travel, uh, when we come across them, uh, and we want to get up close and personal with them, and sometimes, though, it's that economic, it's that self-interested component that takes precedence over some of these experiences, some of these opportunities, all right? And so, once again, we need to start asking different questions. So let me introduce to you, um, once again, the code, the UNWTO Code of Ethics has 11 articles, or 10 articles, rather. And so, within this publication, and this is which, what made it problematic to some of the reviewers in our field, is that we just haven't wrapped our head around this concept in the past. So what I'm going to do for you here is introduce this new, this 11th article that we hope the UNWTO should uh, sit up and take notice of. Okay, and there's seven of these, and bear with me as I move my way through them. Millions of animals, wild or domesticated, are used annually in tourism for human enjoyment and benefit. A more responsible tourism industry can be established from a culture of respect, and I was really pleased to hear Michael talking about this aspect of res respect in his, in, his, uh, in his presentation. That takes into consideration the conditions in which these animals work and live and how we interact with these animals, and if we should interact with them in ways that cause undue suffering. So this is a point of departure for us, and we get a little bit more specific here. In using domesticated animals, handlers should have access to the most up-to-date information on the proper welfare standards for all species used. Animals should be free from fear, pain, hunger, thirst, discomfort, injury, and disease. These are the five freedoms that we talk about in animal welf welfare. And should be able to express behavior normal for the species in enclosures that are of sufficient size, if we are, again, using enclosures. And there is a big question here. Uh, again, this is a welfare component. There is a big question that we have to deal with res with respect to animal rights because the two are not the same. We'll talk about ecotourism in a second, the, sort of the second half of my presentation, so we'll get to that in a second. Hunters and anglers should use techniques and technologies that are designed to minimize unnecessary or prolonged pain, fear, and suffering in, in the animals that they pursue. Again, we're not talking specifically about ecotourism here. We're talking about tourism in general. These practices should complement regional conservation initiatives that work towards healthy populations and healthy ecosystems. Fifth, uh, you know, the trade in endangered species is really quite significant out there, and you, we certainly do need a lot more education, a lot more information in those cases, those circumstances where we come across these products. So every effort should be made to extinguish practices that use animals illegally or in extreme ways for human pleasure in ways that compromise, compromise animal health and well-being. Uh, well and for those practices that are deemed legal, but which take on a tremendous, take on a tremendous toll on the uh, well-being of animals, every effort should be made to enact new policies and guidelines okay, that reduce suffering. In certain, some countries, dolphin area, well, they don't have them any longer. Okay, so you're not allowed to keep uh, captive dolphins in certain jurisdictions. Okay, and something, it's a question that we have to ask ourselves in other jurisdictions. If these practices continue to inflict significant degrees of suffering, measures must be taken to justify whether or not these practices should continue. And the last one here is, and, and I wanted to show you this example. If you're interested in, in looking at a welfare uh, organization out there that's doing a great job, it is The Brook. It's a UK not-for-profit organization, and what they're charged with, or what the responsibility is, is to uh, provide veterinary care for animals that are used in the tourism industry in these sorts of practices. Okay, and to educate their handlers and to provide them with the resources to feed these animals properly. So all individuals or groups that use animals for tourism purposes should have access to organizations like the Brook that have as their mandate the reduction of animal suffering through the implementation of proper welfare standards and care appropriate for all species used. And I think it's really important. This is an example. Many of you have likely come across the, the Tiger Temple in, in, in Thailand. Uh, it's an example of a place where tourists tend to flock to and uh, get up and close and personal with tigers. And 
there are some issues built into this, right, in terms of the, the, uh, how they treat the animals and, uh, you know, the conditions that they place them in that allow tourists to get up close and personal with them. So Schmitz, uh, you know, it matters not whether animals are equal to human beings along cognitive lines. There's, a t there's lots and lots of information, lots of data out there, lots of good philosophy that suggests that we need to be looking at these creatures, these animal others, completely different lines. Respect is a duty that's, that's owed to animals, and we really should be looking at intrinsic values, okay, those non-instrumental values. It's not just about the commodification of animals here. Okay, it's how we can use them or interact with them on a completely different level. And so what about priorities not tied to entertainment? Well, tourism is an entertainment industry. Okay, and when we travel, we save up for the better part of a year. And when we travel, we want to shed that moral cloak that sometimes we, we wear when we're at home. And so it gives us the wherewithal to participate, to experience, to do things that we might not otherwise do at home. And this, you know, filters down to our, our interactions with animal others. So let's look at ecotourism a little bit more. And I know Michael, when I talked to Michael about a presentation topic, he came across this other study that I was involved in and thought that it would be a good idea to use this a little bit more to tie into some of the things that we're talking about today. So the number of tourists seeking interaction with wildlife is growing. We know that in ecotourism, okay? We see it worldwide. It's placing tremendous pressure on wildlife. Huge numbers of tourists, okay, putting pressure on vulnerable populations, species. And I use this, this uh, slide intentionally here. Ecotourism continues to morph into something uh, larger than, than it really is. Kelly and I were just talking about, you know, different forms of ecotourism and whether or not hunting should be a form of ecotourism or whether or not fishing should uh, be a, a form of ecotourism. These are big questions. We've wrestled with them in the ecotourism industry for years. So this places even more pressure on animals and more pressure on those ecosystems. And the big question for me, and it's always been this way, is that why does hunting, why does fishing, why is it that zoos, so many other different forms of the use of animals have to be called ecotourism. I know it's that really sexy term, all right, and it's been used liberally, but it just seems that it's, it's captured the imagination of so many people in so many different ways that it's a term that's really been misused. So I don't see clear thinking on how to protect the interests of animals used in, in, in ecotourism, okay, um, in, the liter in the literature a clear principle guiding the actions of the entire ecotourism industry. And so once again, this is a point of departure for me. Let me use an example here. So we've got fishing as ecotourism, which has been, traditionally speaking, an acceptable form of ecotourism. If we use this definition, responsible travel that conserves the environment and sustains the well-being of local people, there's three important components here. There's responsible travel, okay, there's conserves the environment, and we also have to take into consideration the needs of local people. But when we break that definition down, an activity like fishing can be responsible in the way that we implement catch limits. It can conserve the environment, much the same way that Ducks Unlimited conserves the environment for, for duck hunting. And thirdly, it can contribute to or improve the welfare of local people by soliciting the use of a an uh, Aboriginal individual, a local guide to help take us out into the back 40. So when we use those sorts of definitions, it sort of opens the door to different interpretation and invites different sorts of activities through that door. Let me give you an example of a, of a situation I was involved with with some of my colleagues, uh, one of whom was down at the University of, University of Florida. Uh, Alan Grafe is, is an author here and also Robert Ditton. And so they were arguing that bill fishing, the fishing for marlin, for example, was a, was a form of ecotourism. Back, they wrote a paper in 1998. They said it was ecotourism because it, it, it occurs in a natural uh, resource, or it involves tagging fish for research and conservation. Money goes into the fishery, money to the local economy, employment and entrepreneurial opportunities for local people. This stuff is all very important. There's no question about that, but there are some larger enterprises that we need to start to think about. And what they're adopting, although they didn't say it in the paper, was an ecocentric way of looking at the world. 
So what do we mean by that? So moral value is placed on, on, the, uh, on the natural environment as a whole. So if you were adopting an ecocentric viewpoint of the world, it's, it's the biosphere. It's, it's everything that in, is in our ecosystem that we have to take into consideration. We extend moral consideration to that ecosystem or to that region that we're talking about. And this is really right down uh, Aldo Leopold's lane. He says, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It's wrong when it tends otherwise. So hunting is right if it preserves the integrity, stability, beauty of the natural world. As long as a population is in check, okay, we have no concerns. And, you know, to take this one step further, resources are better spent preserving habitat and not worrying about individual animals. Those of you who are in animal studies, human-animal interactions will understand this quite clearly. So the, once again, there are other questions that we need to start to ask. What about the interests of individual animals in ecotourism? When we talk about other forms of tourism, that's a different question, okay? We're talking about ecotourism here. So individuals extended only secondary moral consideration. So is animal pain and suffering, even death and catch and release, and there's lots of evidence out there, as we were just talking about, to suggest that catch and release fishing isn't as ethical isn't as responsible or sustainable that we sometimes think it is. Okay, so is animal pain and suffering, even death, acceptable in ecotourism? It's a big question that we have to ask. Let me give you a second example here, and this is um, Zeus's ecotourism. A colleague of mine, a col colleague of ours, uh, Peter Mason, thinks that uh, zoos can be an acceptable form of ecotourism, and the reason being is because they're involved in conservation. Well, they're certainly involved in education. The extent to which they're involved in conservation is certainly open to debate. But because of this, and because the fact that tourists can get up close and personal with these animals, you know, he sense, tends to think that we can draw that into the, into the realm of ecotourism. <coughs> but the, once again, there, if, if you start to do, if you poke around a little bit and start to look at some of the literature outside of our field of tourism, we understand that there's problems. Too much stimulation equals pathologies. Too little stimulation, depression, and disease. So poor welfare of the animals in zoo environments can be found in these extremes. Many philosophers uh, feel that zoos are more like prisons, okay? Little chance to live the lives that, that animals are supposed to live. And the big one here is that they're denied this chance to express normal behaviors. And I want you to remember that because we're gonna to touch on it a little bit later. Again, I'm, I'm almost through the slides here, but I think this is a really important point and it has so much to do with what we view as ecotourism, what ecotourism ought to be all about. So no matter how zoos and aquaria change their themes and spaces, they can make their spaces larger. Okay, and that satisfies a lot of critics a lot of the times. They remain morally objectionable because they keep animals as captives. So let's give you a little bit of a definition. Maybe I should have done this a bit earlier, but I'll give you, uh, we've talked about one definition. This is a, a definition that I tend to support. Ecotourism is travel with the primary interest in the natural history of a destination. Certainly there are some cultural com components that we can build into this, especially how people interact with the landscape, interact and live within the land. I think that's important too, but it's a primary interest in the, na in the natural history of a destination. It's nature-based, it takes place in nature. It's learning-based. Ecotourists travel because of that element of education. They wanna learn about the places that they visit. They wanna understand about what is it, what is it, is it about army ants or three-toed sloths, and they wanna return home with that information. Okay, knowing a little bit more about their world. It's sustainable in the sense that it contributes to, uh, well, local participation and benefits. We need people involved in the industry, and we need to spread those benefits liberally throughout those communities. And certainly there's this aspect of biodiversity conservation as well. It really ought to be about putting money into these conservation initiatives to make sure, once again, that we're talking about the human side of it, but also the non-human side of things too. And for me, the most important element here, and it's not widely discussed, uh, it is amongst uh, you know, a few of us, a few of my colleagues, we think that ethics is probably the most important aspect of this broader definition of ecotourism. So ecotourism carries with it the hope, the promise of a more ethical type of tourism. We see that in the literature. 
we see it on websites. We see it operators who are promoting this on their websites. Okay, with, within the, the things, the special things that they're trying to do, you know, to make them a little bit different from their competitors. I think the other important point for you here is that in ecotourism, and I've said this to my students for years, is an attitude and it's an ethic. So does everybody who goes to a national park, can you consider them to be an ecotourist? No, because a lot of them don't carry that, atti that attitude into that protected area or that ethic into the protected. They just don't know. It's our jobs. It's our job to arm them with the ability to understand what's right and wrong in these environments, to tread softly, to tread lightly, and to understand the implications and the consequences of their actions. So given the fact that I've been involved in this subfield for so long, I've, I've had an opportunity to think about it. And what's really brought, what's really pushed me forward as an ecotourism theorist is the, is the work it has been so important for me is the time that I've spent in ethics and more recently the time that I've spent in animal ethics has, has armed me with the ability to think about ecotourism in a completely different capacity. So if we go back to that Article 11, you remember that third one that I left blank on ecotourism, this is what I've put in there. That we should reject as ecotourism any form of animal capture or confinement or other forms of animal abuse that cause suffering for human pleasure and, and entertainment. It's not ecotourism. We put animals behind bars, it's not ecotourism. But until, until now, until recently, we haven't armed ourselves with the ability to think about these sorts of relationships in this capacity. So those are not ecotourism to me. But what is ecotourism is that we should embrace that type of ecotourism that's well managed with ethical programs that seek to view and support free living animals, not subject to human use, abuse rather, and manipulation. This is a wonderful picture of a place that's near and dear to my heart. And for those of us who live in Ontario, it's Algonquin Provincial Park. It's Ontario's first provincial park. And it's an example of, as I say in that little comment there, where animals are free living and they can choose to stay in that relationship or in that interaction, or they can choose to leave. But it's not us holding them there. It's not us keeping them there. It's not us manipulating them in order for us to enjoy that experience at their expense. So is ecotourism about nature, or is it really about us? For the most part, I think it's about us. Until we start to think about something like a first principle that pulls us back a little bit, that asks us to take into consideration not only our own interests, but the interests of others. So in conclusion, I just wanted to say that we've really missed the boat. And the boat for me is this animal ethics literature that I think is so important, especially for eco, it's important for other aspects, other facets of tourism, but it's especially important for ecotourism. And we haven't gone there. We're just starting to go there now. So we've been looking at problems in, in tourism and ecotourism, to my thinking, the wrong way. We're trying to go through the door and in a completely different way, okay? And we're not looking at the big picture. The UNWTO Code of Ethics, to me, reinforces this. It's anthropocentric. It doesn't take into consideration, at least for me, what I think should be sustainability and should be responsibility. And so we need a new definition of what responsible means in tourism, especially ecotourism. And so we need to move away from commodification and exploitation of, of wildlife, and we can only do that again by looking at the bigger picture. And I'll just leave you with this, this quote from uh, the bearable lightness of being um, Kundera in 1984, which has a significant impact on me. But we have a billion tourists traveling around the world now. And as the UNWTO says, we have a billion opportunities. I think education is really key here in, in terms of how we direct those opportunities. Until now, OK, it's been it, it's been a one-way street. And so I think as we move forward from the year 2015 and beyond, we have a, a world of opportunities to think about the tourism in a completely different way. Uh, some of the things I've tried to share with you today are maybe the tip of the iceberg, okay? But uh, I think it's that human ingenuity and that education and the learning and in the true spirit of ecotourism, there certainly is definitely another direction out there that we need to follow. Okay, with that I'll, I'll wrap it up.